Welcome to Orbital Dynamics, Part 7. In this part, I'm going to describe one of the seminal discoveries in orbital dynamics, Johannes Kepler's discovery that orbital paths are elliptical. I'm going to talk about some of the history and then explain how Kepler went about solving this problem. It was a problem that vexed him for decades until he solved it. Kepler couldn't have done what he did without Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe was a Danish nobleman known for his accurate and comprehensive astronomical and planetary observations. He was well known in his lifetime as an astronomer and alchemist. No one before Tycho had attempted to make so many planetary observations. He achieved his goal of measuring to one minute of arc, that's 1 60th of a degree. That was a tremendous feat before the invention of the telescope by Galileo 10 years later. His aim was to confirm his own picture of the universe, which was that the Earth was at rest, the Sun went around the Earth, and the planets all went around the Sun, an intermediate picture between Ptolemy and Copernicus. His planetary model was wrong, but the accuracy of his data enabled Kepler to confirm Copernicus's more intuitive model. Johannes Kepler was a German mathematician, astronomer, and astrologer, and a key figure in the 17th century scientific revolution. In early 1600, Kepler met Tycho Brahe, where his new observatory was being constructed near Prague in the Czech Republic. Over the next two months, he stayed as a guest, analyzing some of Tycho's observations of Mars. Brahe guarded his data closely, but was impressed by Kepler's theoretical ideas and soon allowed him more access. Kepler planned to test his theories based on Brahe's Mars data. Kepler had spent years developing other theories and realized that Brahe's data could settle the question of how planets orbited. He went to work for Brahe in 1600. Brahe died the following year because of complications from a burst bladder. He was at a banquet where he drank too much. In those days, it was rude to get up from the table, and so his bladder burst. Others believe, however, that, Ty that Brahe may have been poisoned. Speculation was that it was Kepler who poisoned him. We'll probably never know. After Brahe's death, Kepler stole his data before the Brahe family could secure it. Over the next 11 years, Kepler developed his laws of planetary motion. Kepler's models, based on Brahe's data, improved predictions 1,500 times over the prevalent methods that have been in widespread use for centuries. Where Copernicus had failed, Kepler succeeded because of the better accuracy of Kepler's predictions. Later on, Kepler's theories provided one of the foundations for Isaac Newton's theory of universal gravitation, which I'll talk about in a later part. There's a famous quote where Newton said he stood on the shoulders of giants. Kepler was one of the people he was referring to. Kepler's laws were radical claims. The prevailing belief, especially in epicycle-based theories, was that orbits should be based on perfect circles. Most of the planets follow orbits of low eccentricity and are closely approximated as circles. More centric orbits were modeled with deference in epicycles or with offset circles. And all of those are circles. Detailed calculations for the orbit of the planet Mars first indicated to Kepler its elliptical shape, and he inferred that other heavenly bodies, including those farther away from the sun, followed elliptical paths too. Copernicus's theories were philosophical and somewhat geometric. Kepler's theories are purely geometric. A law of physics for orbital motion had to wait for Isaac Newton, which he developed about 60 years later. Kepler hence didn't understand the physics behind elliptical orbital paths. All he knew was that ellipses fit the data better and that that model based on elliptical orbital shapes resulted in more accurate predictions. Kepler devoted six years before, Tycho's, before Brahe's death struggling with the motion of the planet Mars. Because the observed irregularities of its motion were greater than those of any other planet, the motion of Mars could not be easily described in terms of the ideal of uniform circular motion. Rather than resort to Ptolemaic deference and epicycles, Kepler sought to discover a smooth continuous curve in which the planets orbited. Accepting the Copernican view that the Earth orbited the Sun meant Kepler had to find this curve on the basis of observations from a moving Earth which itself orbited the Sun, and he had to assume too that the Earth probably orbited in a non-circular way. Kepler knew the length of the Martian year, 687 days, and he of course knew the length of the Earth year, 365 days. This animation shows the periods of Earth and Mars relative to the Sun. For each Martian year, the Earth orbits the Sun about 1.88 times, and that's 687 divided by 365. Kepler's aim was to determine a smooth curve that accurately modeled the orbit of Mars. 
Ptolemy's methods of deference and epicycles was good at predicting the motion, but the motions were erratic. No one believed the planets actually moved that way. Kepler was obsessed with coming up with a smooth curve. In breaking down this problem, Kepler used Mars to determine the Earth orbit and then used that Earth orbit to determine the orbit of Mars. Here's how Kepler determined the orbit of the Earth. Consider a point in both um, the Earth and Mars orbit where the Sun, Earth, and Mars are in a straight line. One Martian year is 687 days. In that same time, the Earth orbits 1.88 times, which, as I said, is 687 divided by 365. Thus, when Mars is again at point M, the Earth is at point E1. One Martian year later, Mars will be again at point N, M, and the Earth will be at point E2. And one more Martian year later, Mars will be at point M and the Earth will be at a fourth point. All of this was measured against a stellar background. Look at the points for Earth, E2, E1, and E0. If you look at Mars from each of these points, you see a different set of stars in the background. This enabled Kepler to determine the relative position of the Sun, Earth, and Mars. If the Earth orbit were perfectly circular, the angle between each successive Earth position would be 43 degrees, and it wasn't. By the way, part of why these calculations worked is that after each Martian year, Mars ends up at almost exactly the same place. That's fundamental to orbital dynamics. There's some variability in the position of Mars over a Martian year, but it's very small. If the position M were different after each successive orbit, Kepler never would have been able to characterize Earth's orbit. To determine the Mars orbit, Kepler chose points at different times when the Sun, Earth, and Mars were aligned. This occurred about every 26 months. Brahe provided Kepler with 12 of these measurements, and here I'll show six hypothetical measurements. So the first was E0, M0. Next was e E1, M1. Next was E2M2, and so on. Notice the points M0, M1, and M2 don't line up with the circle. I did that purposely, and this is highly exaggerated. Those last two points don't line up on the line of sight just because I couldn't get the animation to work. So the points M1 prime, M2 prime, and M3 prime would have been the points on if the Martian orbit were along a circle. The actual points that Brahe measured didn't line up well with a circular orbit. Earth's orbit is very close to circular. Hipparchus, 1600 years earlier, solved this by shifting the circle slightly off center. Because Earth's orbit is very nearly circle, circular, this would have worked. This animation shows a more realistic picture of what Kepler was dealing with. Here's an ellipse with 0.5 eccentricity. The eccentricity of the Mars orbit is 0.0934, so that's what this would look like. If I draw a circular orbit with the Earth at the center, it would show up this way. If I draw it, a circular orbit with the center aligned with the center of the ellipse, you can see the circle and the ellipse almost line up perfectly. Now I'm going to draw 10 blue points and two red ones. Kepler initially modeled the orbit of Mars correctly, but didn't realize that he did that with an ellipse. He knew the shape was somewhat oval, but didn't yet figure out that it was an ellipse. The common thinking was that the orbit was circular and off-center, so he abandoned the oval theory and went back to an offset circle. That worked well for 10 of the 12 observations. For the 11th and 12th, it didn't work so well. The disagreement in the data that Kepler was dealing with in these last two points was eight minutes of arc. Here, Brahe's measurement accuracy proved pivotal. Prior to Brahe's measurement accuracy was within 10 minutes of arc. 
Brahe retrieved one to two minutes of arc measurement accuracy, and without that accuracy, Kepler wouldn't have noticed enough of a difference in these last two points. Faced with giving up the ideal of off-center circular motions or giving up on Tycho's observations, Kepler chose to believe Tycho's observations. After months of agonizing calculations, Kepler fit the orbit of Mars with an ellipse and thus formulated his first law. By the way, he formulated both his first law and second law at the same time. I'll explain in the next part how the two had to go together. The second law deals with the speed of Mars in its orbit around these points. Here's a quote from Kepler's Astronomia Nova, published in 1609. I was almost driven to madness in considering and calculating the matter. I could not find out why the planet Mars would rather go on an elliptical orbit. O oh, ridiculous me, with reasoning derived from physical principles, agreeing with experience, there is no figure left for the orbit of the planet except for a perfect ellipse. I thought and searched until I went nearly mad for a reason why the planet Mars preferred an elliptical orbit. Ah, what a foolish bird I had been. And that's the end of the quote. Lucky for Kepler, the orbit of Mars is one of the most elliptical-shaped orbits in the visible sky. Pluto is more elliptical, but wasn't discovered well until well after Kepler. Mercury is also more elliptical, but Kepler focused on Mars instead. The geometric constructions I just showed you were hypothetical. Here's a simulation with satellite toolkit that depicts a circular Earth orbit and one with a 0.0170 eccentricity which is the true eccentricity of Earth's orbit. I'll tell you what eccentricity is a little bit later. There's not a lot of difference in these orbits. If you look closely, you can see, however, that they don't line up exactly. If you watch part four, you remember this slide. In the previous slide I just showed you, I said there was not a lot of difference between an Earth orbit that is elliptical and one that's circular. Earth's orbit is eccentric enough, however, to cause a four-day difference between fall in winter and a 40 difference between spring and summer. What were uh, Brahe and Kepler actually looking at? This animation shows you an example. The eccentricity of the Martian orbit is more pronounced. The interior uh, teal orbit is the Earth. The exterior orbits are hypothetical circular Martian orbit in yellow and an orbit with proper eccentricity of 0. 0934 in purple. There's a big difference between these two orbits because the Earth, or I'm sorry, the Sun is at the center of the circle and at the focus of the ellipse. The video on the right is the top perspective. The one on the left are the two Martian orbits, one circular and one elliptical. Kepler would have, and Brahe would have observed the purple dot. The yellow dot is hypothetical and no one believed the planet Mars orbited that way. All Kepler had to go on was a few observations of the position of the purple Mars planet. From this, he ascertained the elliptical shape of the Martian orbit. Imagine taking 12 measurements against a stellar background. I mentioned that the accuracy of Brahe's data enabled Kepler to make this discovery. And one minute of arc is 1 60th of a degree. This was a huge discovery. When orbits were modeled with erratic motions, there was no way to develop a law of physics that explained those motions. When orbits were modeled with offset circles, the impetus that would keep a planet in its orbit would also have been a mystery. Placing the central body at the focus of an elliptical orbit enabled future mathematicians and astronomers like Newton to theorize about a centralized force that kept planets in orbit. It meant that these mathematicians and astronomers could develop equations with a central body at the origin. None of the geometric models prior to that allowed for that. This led to later theories developed especially by Newton that explained the physics behind these orbits. Now I want to teach you the geometry of ellipses. I'm going to show you later that elliptical orbits are idealized. They're good approximations but aren't perfect. For orbital dynamics, however, we'll talk a lot about ellipses. It's helpful you if you understand them, and that's what I aim to do here. Let's start with a simple case, a circle. Imagine the black line from C to the orange point is a string. Tie pencils to the end, which is the orange point, and you can circumscribe a circle. The only thing adjustable, the only degree of freedom, is the radius. With a longer string, you get a bigger circle.
You can draw an ellipse in a similar way. Take a slack string tied to two points and then with a pencil hold the string taut. The shape you circumscribe is an ellipse. Notice that the length of the string is equal to the width of the ellipse. This is actually the formal definition, formal geometric definition of an ellipse. The two points that the string were tied to are called focus points. You can determine those by measuring half the width and then drawing an arc, setting the compass at the top of the ellipse. The length of A plus B, the two parts of the string, is always equal to the entire width of the ellipse. The major axis is the length of the widest part of the ellipse. The minor axis is the length of the shortest part of the ellipse. Notice that when the ellipse becomes a circle, the focus points collapse at the center, and the major and minor axis lengths are equal. Half the minor axis is the semi-minor axis. Half the major axis is the semi-major axis. This animation has a mistake. Where it says major axis, it should say semi-major axis. If I change the shape of the ellipse, so the narrow part is on the horizontal, the semi-major and semi-minor axes are swapped. We refer to the semi-major axis a lot in orbital dynamics. It's a term you should remember. Here we have an ellipse with a semi-major axis of three, semi-minor axis of three, and a semi-major axis of five. The length of the distance from the top to a focus point is five. This equals the length of the semi-major axis. This is always true for any ellipse. What is the length to the focus? The Pythagorean theorem says that since the A side is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, A squared equals B squared plus F squared. If we want to solve for F, we'd say that F squared equals A squared minus B squared. F thus equals the square root of A squared minus B squared. F is actually equal to plus or minus the square root. A negative F doesn't make sense here. We only need the positive solution of the square root. If we plug in numbers from the diagram, F equals the square root of five squared minus three squared. That equals the square root of 25 minus nine. F thus equals the square root of 16, and that equals four. The length from the center to the focus is four for this ellipse. With this animation, you can see how that works out. F equals the square root of the semi-major axis squared minus the semi-minor axis squared. If I collapse the focus points into one point, I get a circle where F equals zero. The shape of the ellipse is characterized by a parameter we call eccentricity. It's the ratio of the semi-major axis and the focus length. For a circle, eccentricity equals zero. When the eccentricity approaches one, the ellipse collapses into another shape that I'll show you later. The convention in or orbital dynamics is to, to define ellipses with semi-major axis and eccentricity. You can use any two terms. You could use semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, you could use focus length and semi-major axis and so on. The eccentricity of the ellipse tells us something about the shape of the orbit. The semi-major axis tells us something about the size of the orbit. Let's go back to our geometric construction. We have lengths for the semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, and focus. Remember that the length of the diagonal equals the length of the semi-major axis. On the previous slide, I showed you that the eccentricity E equals F uh, the length of the focus divided by A, the semi-major axis. For this ellipse, that's 4 over 5, or 0 0.8. If E equals F over A, then F equals E times A. Recall that A squared equals B squared plus F squared. A squared minus F squared thus equals B squared. Let's reverse the equation. B squared now equals A squared minus F squared. Now go back to this equation, F equals E times A. We can substitute E for 
we can substitute e times a for f. We can factor a squared from both terms. b now equals a squared times 1 minus c e squared. b thus equals the square root of a squared times 1 minus c e squared. We're going to ignore the minus value of the square root because we don't need it. We can take a squared from out, out from under the radical. b thus equals a times the square root of 1 minus e squared. f equals e times a. And b equals a times the square root of 1 minus e squared, where a is the semi-major axis and e is the eccentricity. So from semi-major axis and eccentricity, we can derive the semi-minor axis, b, and the length from the center to a focus, which is f. In orbital dynamics, the convention is to define ellipses with semi-major axis and eccentricity. Here I want to show you some simple calculations. This ellipse has a semi-major axis of 5 and an eccentricity of 0 0.8. f equals e times a, which is 5 times 0 0.8, which equals 4. From that, we can loc locate the focus point. b equals a times the square root of 1 minus e squared. That's 5 times the square root of 1 minus 0 0.8 squared. That's 5 times 1 minus 0.64. And that's 5 times the square root of 0 0.36. And that's 5 times 0 0.6, which equals 3. From that, we know the length of the semi-minor axis. We've now fully characterized this ellipse from the two terms, semi-major axis and eccentricity. I want to talk a bit about areas of these shapes. As you know, the area of a circle is pi r squared. The area of an ellipse is pi times the semi-major axis times the semi-minor axis. If you make this a circle, the semi-major axis and semi-minor axis are the same length, and that's the same as pi r squared. Here's a fun fact that you don't need to know for orbital dynamics. If you draw a tangent line at the orange point, the angles formed by the tangent line and the A segment and the tangent line of the B segment are always equal. There are miniature golf courses that have holes in the shape of an ellipse. They put the tee at one focus and the hole at the other. If you hit the ball toward an edge, it always results in a perfect bank shot. An ellipse is one of four geometric forms called conic sections. Imagine a two-sided cone and a plane that cuts through it. If the cutting plane is level, you get a circle. If it's tilted, you get an ellipse. Tilt the cutting plane even further, and you get a parabola. And tilt it even further, and you get a hyperbola. A circle and ellipse are closed forms. A parabola and a hyperbola are open forms. The shape of these forms can be characterized by their eccentricity. If E equals 0, you get a circle. If E is um, greater than 0 and less than 1, you get an ellipse. If E is equal to 1, you get a parabola. If E is greater than 1, you get um, half of a hyperbola. I don't think Kepler thought much about conic sections, but Newton certainly did. I'll talk about Newton later, but for now, I'll tell you that he figured out that an object traveling through space could orbit in a circle or an ellipse or it could travel in a parabolic or hyperbolic trajectory. The people who devised the equations for orbital dynamics arranged things so that the energy of a moving body was negative if the eccentricity was less than 1, 0 if the eccentricity equaled 1, and positive if the eccentricity was greater than 1. I'll show you those derivations later. It was a nice convention that results in a bound orbit having negative energy and an unbound trajectory having either 0 or positive energy. Some of the conventions of orbital dynamics offer conveniences. Others, not so much. This was one of the good ones. I want to show you some terms that are used to reference parts of an ellipse and angles within an ellipse. I already told you that the widest part of an ellipse is the major axis. Half the width is the semi-major axis for the widest part. For orbital dynamics, this is an important term. I also told you that the more narrow part of the ellipse is the semi-minor axis. We don't use this term in orbital dynamics. 
Here's one focus, which I'll call the primary focus. And here's another. Kepler discovered that orbits are elliptical with a central body at one focus. We'll typically choose the right-hand focus as the primary focus. Notice that there's nothing going on at the center of the ellipse and nothing going on at the other focus. This is a vertex. With respect to the primary focus, we call this vertex periapsis. This vertex is the point of an orbit we call apoapsis. Periapsis is the closest point to the primary focus. Apoapsis is the farthest point away. This point is called a covertex. There are two of them. We don't refer to this point much in orbital dynamics. And let's put an orbiting body on the ellipse. The point can be anywhere on the ellipse. In fact, orbiting bodies are in constant motion. So this point would sweep a path through the elliptical shape. So it's more proper to say that this point at any given time could be anywhere on the ellipse. This angle is called the true anomaly. It's the angle formed by the periapsis point and the position. This is the angle to the same position point, but from the center of the ellipse. We have no use for this angle in orbital dynamics. Let's draw a circle around the ellipse. When we get to Kepler's third law, you'll learn that the period of an orbit along the circular path is the same as the period for an elliptical path. That's because the semi-major axis is the same in both cases. Remember that the semi-major axis of a circle is simply the radius. If we draw a line segment perpendicular to the horizontal axis and through the position point, there's a point of intersection with the circle. This angle is called the eccentric anomaly. It doesn't correspond to the actual position of an orbiting body. We'll need this angle, however, for one of the derivations I'll take you through later. Otherwise, it's a meaningless angle. This angle here is the mean anomaly. It took some time for the orbiting body to go from the periapsis point to the position point. If the body were in a circular orbit, it would be at the mean anomaly point in the same amount of time. Some of the derivations we'll do start with simple circular motion where it's trivial to compute the mean anomaly. An orbiting body in a circular orbit travels at a constant speed, so the mean anomaly is easy to compute. Other than that, this angle is meaningless. By the way, the mean anomaly is measured with respect to the center of the ellipse, or more correctly, the center of the circle that surrounds the ellipse. The center point is also where the focus is located in a circle, so this is the correct point of reference for a circle. I mentioned three angles, true anomaly, eccentric anomaly, and mean anomaly. Why the term anomaly? It's because the ellipse is thought to be an anomalous shape. Remember that back in the day, the ancients thought that orbiting bodies followed perfect circles. By all rights, after Kepler's discovery, the circle should have been the anomalous case. But these terms, even though they aren't correct, got stuck with the designation anomaly. I'm going to switch to the other focus so I have some room on the drawing. The line, this line segment here is called the semi-lattice rectum, and this line segment is called the directrix. If I draw this vertical line, the directrix would always be perpendicular and start on this line. The semi-lattice rectum always connects the focus to the position point. We can use the directrix and semi-lattice rectum to construct an ellipse. I'll show you um, that with an animation in a minute. Before I do that, there's one more parameter I need to show you. The other parameter determines the location of the director's baseline relative to the center of the ellipse. I'll need that to set up the animation I'm going to show you on the next slide. In setting this up, I put the position point at the periapsis vertex, so the directrix and semi-lattice rectum are in a straight line. I want to be able to compute this uh, length I call very simply length. In general, the eccentricity of an ellipse is a semi-lattice rectum divided by the directrix. In fact, that defines the lengths of both the semi-lattice rectum and the directrix. To make this ratio come out right, I need to place the baseline for the directrix in the proper place. Length is A, the semi-major axis plus D, the length of the directrix, but only when the directrix intersects with the periaptic vertex. That's intuitive from this diagram. If E equals SLR over D, then D, the length of the directrix, equals SLR over E. The length thus equals A plus SLR over E. I simply substituted SLR over E for D. A, the semi-major axis, equals SLR plus F. That's also intuitive from this diagram. Again, this is only true when the semi-lattice rectum intersects the periapsis vertex. 
If A equals SLR plus F, then SLR equals A minus F. Length thus equals A plus A minus F over E. Recall that F over E, then F equals E times A. That's how we derive the focal length a few slides back. Length thus equals A plus A minus E times A over A. All I did here was substitute E times A for F. If I expand out the last term, I get that length equals A plus A over E minus E times, length equals A plus A over E minus E times A over E. I can also express that as length equals A times E minus A. And in the last term, all I did was factor out the uh, E over E, which equals one. Length, um, because in this previous equation, I have A and minus A length, simply equals A divided by E. I can also express that as length equals A squared over E times A. And if you recall, E times A equals F, so length equals A squared over F. I like the previous equation better, length equals A over E, but I used the last equation in the animation I'm about to show you, and I was too lazy to redo it. So let's go with length equals A squared divided by F. This animation shows you the relationship between the semi-lattice rectum and the directrix. directrix. It's another way beyond the pencil and slack string method we can use to construct an ellipse. I'm showing you here how I set this up in Geometry Sketchpad. First, I'll display the grid. Next, I'll construct an ellipse. You can download the ellipse tool from the Sketchpad's website. This tool creates an ellipse with two focus points and an edge point. You can change the shape of the ellipse with these three points. Next, I'll create two lines and a point on each of the lines. I'll use these as slider bars. This point I'll use to define the eccentricity, so I'll label it eccentricity. And I'll use this point to define the semi-major axis, so I'll label it semi-major axis. With Geometry Sketchpad, I can measure the value of the eccentricity point on the line. For an ellipse, the eccentricity is between zero and one, and that's what you get coincidentally when you measure this point value on the line. So I can use that value directly, and I'll change this measure to eccentricity. I want the semi-major axis to be between zero and 10, so I'll create a semi-major axis, a maximum semi-major axis parameter. I'll then measure the value of the semi-major axis point on its line, which is the number between zero and one. And then I'll multiply that by the parameter max semi-major axis, which is 10. And then I'll rename it, I'll label this semi-major axis. Now I want to set semi-major axis to five and eccentricity to 0.8. Here I'm multiplying eccentricity times the semi-major axis, and that gives me the length of the focus point. So I'll label this focal length. I'll also compute the negative of the focal length. For this ellipse, the focal length is 4.01. Now I'll plot the focal length of the y-axis. And then I'll merge these two points. Now, 
as the focal length changes, this ellipse shape is going to change. Now I'll plot the negative focal length on the y-axis. And then I'll merge these two points. Next, I'll plot the semi-major axis on the y-axis. And then I'll merge these two points. Now, if I adjust the eccentricity slider, it changes the eccentricity of the ellipse. If I adjust the semi-major axis slider, it changes the size of the ellipse. Now I'm going to calculate minus the semi-major axis squared divided by the focal length. This is the formula I derived on the previous slide. And now I'll plot that on the y-axis. Because I use the ne negative value, this point shows up below the ellipse. This point defines the location of the directrix line. I'll create the directrix baseline by creating a line that goes through this point and is perpendicular with the y-axis. And now I'll put a position point on the ellipse here. And we'll create a line that goes through that point and is perpendicular to the directrix baseline. And I'll create a line segment between the directrix line and the point on the ellipse. And then I'll create a line segment between the point on the ellipse and the nearest focus. Now I'm going to hide the perpendicular line, the grid, and the x and y axes. Now I'll label this line directrix. And this one, semi-lattice rectum. So notice I can move the point on the ellipse, and I'm going to shift these labels around for readability. I'll label this point F for focus. And here's the other focus. Now if I change the eccentricity, notice the directrix baseline shifts along with the ellipse. Now I want to measure the length of the semi-lattice rectum and the length of the directrix. And now I'm going to take the ratio of the semi-lattice rectum and the directrix, and that equals the eccentricity, which is how I define the lengths of semi-lattice rectum and directrix. Now, if I move the point anywhere on the ellipse, the ratio of semi-lattice rectum and directrix is always a constant, 0 0.8. And that's true even if I change the eccentricity. Notice the directrix baseline got lower, which changed the ratio. If I make the eccentricity closer to 1, the ratios are 0.94. And even if I change the semi-major axis, the ratios remain the same, 0 0.8. Notice what happens if the eccentricity goes to 1 or to 0, the ellipse disappears. At 0, the ellipse should be a circle, but in this construction, it disappears. If the ratio of the semi-lattice rectum and directrix equal 1, you get a parabola. 
if I move the point on the parabola, the ratio of the semi-lattice spectrum and directrix is always one. If the ratio of the semi-lattice spectrum and the directrix is greater than one, I get a hyperbola. If I move the point on the hyperbola, the ratio is always greater than one. If I change the eccentricity or the ratio of the semi-lattice rectum and directrix, the shape of the hyperbola changes. But the ratio always remains the same. Here's another way you can construct an ellipse. This construction was used by Isaac Newton to derive Kepler's first law from Newton's force equation, which I'll explain in more detail later. So you start with a circle, and I'm going to hide the sizing point on the circle. And then I want to draw a line horizontally to the left and then construct a ray from the center of the circle. And I'll hide that point. Now I want to put a point on the ray and a point on the circle. And by doing it this way with Sketchpad, I can move these points, one along the circle, the other along the ray. I want to create a line segment from the point on the ray to the point on the circle and another line segment from the point on the circle, actually a ray from the point on the circle through the center of the circle. Now I'll find the midpoint of this line here, and then I'll construct this perpendicular line. And now I want to form the intersection between these two lines. Now notice I can move the point on the circle and this whole construction adjusts. And this angle always remains a right angle because in Sketchpad I constructed that as a perpendicular line. In Sketchpad, I can trace this point as I move the point on the circle. And you'll notice if I move the point on the circle, this construction creates an ellipse. Here yeah, I'm going to erase the traces and I'm going to turn tracing off. Now I made this point movable as well. I want to move it outside the circle. Now I want to turn tracing on, on this point again. And now notice what happens. I'm now tracing a hyperbola. All right, I'm going to erase all the traces and I'm going to turn tracing off and I'm going to return this point inside the circle. Another feature in Sketchpad, if I select the movable point and then the trace point, I can construct a locus. And let me color this red. The locus is a shape that you get if you were to move the movable point through all its degrees of freedom. Now watch what happens if I move this point outside the circle. First of all, if I move the point to the center, I get a circle. So this construction will construct a circle. If I move the point outside a circle, I get a hyperbola. And you can see how this construction constructs a hyperbola. Then if I move this point right on the circle, I get a parabola. So this construction is generalized. It will construct any of the conic sections. I want to talk about the derivation of these words. An ellipsis is a grammatical construction where an element in a sentence is omitted. And if you were looking closely, you'll notice that three dots just appeared when I clicked on the mouse. Mathematically, this corresponds to E is less than one. A parable is a short story that makes some um, parallel to life. It corresponds to the shape form with a plane parallel to the cones. And that has an eccentricity of one. 
Hyperbole is an exaggeration or overstatement. It corresponds to E being greater than one. And that is the actual source of all these terms. What do I want you to take away from this part? Well, the first thing is Kepler's first law, that orbiting bodies follow the path of an ellipse, and that in general, any body in motion follows one of the paths defined by a conic section. You should also be familiar with the terms used to, be used to define the different parts of an ellipse, especially the three angles from the focus, true anomaly, mean anomaly, and eccentric anomaly, and the terms we use to define the shape of the ellipse, eccentricity, and semi-major axis.